<laughs> Long as you don't lick it off after we've gone. Ah, you never know, you never know. Okay, uh, we were, um, uh, we dealt with the holiness of God the last couple of weeks, and that was kind of quite a strong, uh, very difficult in some ways uh, thoughts because of his purity and his holiness. Uh, sometimes uh, out, makes our reflection look a little bit, 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 bit Peter Wally in, in, in comparison. Uh, so now we'll move on to something that's a little bit easier for us to deal with. That's a good word, Peter Wally, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, his love. Uh, and that's a popular subject. We, can, we, we, we like talking about his love because that makes a huge difference in our lives. And uh, probably uh, no scriptural topic has been the basis of more sermons and essays than the love of God. A subject of such infinite depths can only be touched on in a class like ours. I think, uh, was this Spurgeon that said he, he preached uh, a thousand sermons on no, John 3.16? No, no, no. He said that he heard a young Englishman in New York preaching on John 3.16 and he preached every night. From, and when he came to the seventh night he said, I've searched all day long to find some new text to bring to you, but I can't find anything Better. so good as the old. So let's go back to God's soul that he gave. Okay. All right. I thought it had someone else at Spurgeon. Well, I, I, I doubt if Spurgeon preached a thousand so, so I wouldn't so. think so. No, no, not even. But, but uh, it's a good subject. It's a common subject and it's a very popular uh, mm. uh, uh, deal. John 3.16 is popular with most people uh, in the religious world. So doubt, no doubt there have been thousands of sermons oh, uh, preached no, no. on this text. <laughs> so put it like that. It's extremely difficult to define love. And we'll try it. We just something to describe it as a ardent affection which hold one holds for another, which in the case of divine love reaches its highest form. <coughs> uh, I don't know whether you heard about the, the, the school, the Church of England school today, who, the teacher who demonstrated love because her class was being destructive and she taped her mouth over. Uh, she now sounds like she's married to get the sack, but anyway, um, you know, love, love can be seen. In, uh, and, and many shapes of form. Anyway, love can <laughs> be separated from the personality of God. Although we read that God is merciful and just, we are never told that He is mercy or justice. Uh, there is an attribute of who He is. In order to know God, we must know love or what love is. And among these things, uh, it's of a divine nature, and love is paramount. <coughs> Sometimes, one of the biggest arguments that many people make against a loving God is the suffering in the world. And they say, how on earth can you say a loving God when I see so, many, so much suffering? Um, I remember um, the big comedian, um, uh, uh, Bryn. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, he was saying, <laughs> how, how on earth can God uh, be, be a, a loving God who has created us when he made so many mistakes? He says, uh, how can a loving God create somebody who when you, when you shirt your teeth together, it catches your lip? Get inside your lip with your teeth. Well, my response would be if, you, if everybody has had such a big mouth as he has, then, uh, you know, it's about to do that. Keep your mouth shut. Yes. But, uh, th so there is an answer to that. But anyway, uh, I would think people with perfect teeth wouldn't have that problem. Uh, in order to know God's love, we must know God. Love is paramount. Uh, and and uh, John says, We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So, we need, uh, verse 16 says, we, need, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in Him. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The whole gospel, the, the, the letters from John, especially that first letter, uh, first John, uh, is, is often described as a letter of love. Uh, it, it's talking about relationship. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, We are <coughs> called the children of God. We are now called the children of God. And we're only enabled to be called the children of God because He loved us and gave His Son to die for us. So there's a, a heavy emphasis on this focus of God is love. God doesn't just love, God is love. Uh, and therefore that's the, the real key essence. Uh, love is part of his nature, part of his being, part of who he is as an individual, 
And therefore, we respond to that. We love because he first loved us. Mm. John informs that God is love. It's not just a characteristic. It is actually what God is as part of his very being. And 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, we conclude that the giving of his Son to save men was the result, not just of love, but of overwhelming love. It's interesting, uh, when, you, when you read the text of, of the Bible, uh, none of the writers are, are really free with, with uh, words. They say in a very small uh, sentence or paragraph, I, I, I read a lot of stuff. Uh, and it's interesting, in this passage here, you have this, what, we, what some would consider, can, can see as an extra word. It could have said, God loved the world. But he didn't say God loved the world. He did say God so mm. loved the world. That just makes a, a total different dimension into that love. You know what Spurgeon said about that? What? He said, come here you astronomers that spy out the spaces, and I'll set you a task that will defy you. Measure this word so. Mm -hmm. God so loved the world. Yeah. That yeah. he gave his own how, can, how can you define it? How you can you contain it? So well. It's just that one of those super, such a small mm. word, but it's such a super word, and especially in this mm. context. God loved the world. No, God so, so loved intense. the world that he gave his son. There's his motivation for giving. He looks at you and me, he sees the mess we're in, and he says, You need something. You need something supreme in your life. And I'm willing to supply that need to his son. It's amazing, really. Therefore, we can know that the extent of his love is so great that his actions are motivated by that which is very part of his character or characteristics. He is love. His love is not influenced like ours is, often, by who or what we are. Romans 5, verse 8 says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know, you and I have the same kind of experience. There are lots of people that we know that we quite like. And there's other people that we know we don't want to get any closer to them. Um, uh, and certainly, there's some people that we know that we, get, if we find it easy to either help or speak to or, or do something for. There's other people where, you know, <coughs> given the choice sometimes, we walk to the other side of the street than uh, do something for them. Because uh, sometimes the way, perhaps they rub us up the wrong way, perhaps we just don't like them, uh, or whatever, whatever it is that motivates us, there are some people who wouldn't hardly even cross the street to help. God isn't influenced by that. And that's an interesting concept. And the problem is, because he loved, he challenged us to love the same way. Peter says, in verse 34, I see very clearly that God doesn't show partiality. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. God's love has no boundaries or restrictions. It's a universal love. God doesn't want anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. We cannot know God and not learn about love. The very definition of coming to know who God is. You see love in practically uh, so many different uh, aspects of the word of God. Love is that quality which defines discipleship to the world. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We, that's, a, that's one of the passages you really should cut out in the Bible. <laughs> there, are a few, there are a few passages in the Bible that I wish weren't in there, uh, and this is possibly one of them, because... There's a lot of things that some of us are known for. Bernard's known for his sweeties. Well, I suppose that's an expression of his love, which he comes close there, okay? But some of, some of, some of us might be known for argumentativeness. Some of us may be known for our stinginess. Some of us Scots may have long, deep pockets uh, sometimes. Maybe uh, yeah. Short arms. <laughs> yeah, short arms, yeah. <laughs> which match, the good match. But in reality, you know, uh, here's a challenge. How are we known by the world? How are we known by our neighbours? How are we known by those people around us? This is difficult. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. <coughs> we struggle with that sometimes. Okay? Really. Even... <laughs> Don't even go there. 
And then, oh. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's like a lot of stuff that's in the Bible. It, it's, it's the ideal situation. <coughs> it's what God challenges to rise to. <coughs> but in our, when we look at ourselves, <coughs> we recognize that often we fall so far short of the ideal that God would like us to be. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's not even true to say that if, if we were truly loving people and did everything that God wanted us to do, then the whole world would flock to be Christians. I, 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 don't, I honestly don't believe that would happen. Because Jesus would be the characteristic of love, the expression of one who seeks the highest good of those around him, one who demonstrated so much by the power of what he did uh, and how he lived that he was the son, very son of God, and yet he was popular in some parts of his, in the other part of his, his, his preaching, but when people really listened to him carefully and stuff like this, by all this, all men will know uh, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, and just like probably you just today, there were people around Jesus at that time who looked around at their neighbours, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all these other people thinking, Ooh, that's just too hard. I don't like that. And they walk away. Mm. Well, if I was to find some way of being kind, showing kindness to my next door neighbour, that would just upset her and make her worse. <laughs> But, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when you think about it, that would be her problem. That's uh, when you think of what Paul, uh, Paul said something like that. He says, he says, by your doing good, he says, you heap burning coals upon the head. No, you know. And and the problem with Paul is, I mean, he 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 was a really um, powerful character, and unfortunately, quite often he echoed much of what Jesus said. Because uh, in one part in Romans he turns around and says, "Don't, uh, oh goodness, it, the phrase just got me. It means don't." Uh, Franco finish for me. Uh, the idea of uh, don't grow weary in well doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So as a, as a, you know, when you when you do something good to somebody and they, they just well, yeah. spurn it or they, they they take it for granted or something, and you think, well, oh, I'm not going to do that again. You know, uh, because because we're human, we we don't want to keep doing that. Uh, he says, "You don't go really well with it, for in due time you'll reap if you faint." No? Yes, buddy. Well, and yesterday it was known that a guy come to um, where we did the work and then like yeah, and he was drunk and he's sort of been sort of uh, probably falling about a bit in that as well, and. Um, he wanted to come in and all that and get a cup of tea, but there's loads of people in there, right? With uh, and he was smelling the drink and everything, and he was you no, know, and you no, know, he had to turn around. So look, you can't come in and all that, yeah. But other people were wanting to bring him in, you know. Yeah. And that, that didn't feel good. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? No, because because you wanted to help him, but you knew that by helping him, the you hinder the other people. You would, would be. Uh, a problem for that. For other people, yeah. you know, it could be a trigger to set. Get somebody to make a cup of tea and take it take out. Well, he did. He got good it made that. outside and all that, and yeah. uh, given stuff outside. That's, that's good. And and then today, <laughs> of all things, there's a phone call from him from the hospital. He collapsed up at a different building. Right. He's in hospital now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? No, mm -hmm. like so. He, it's really difficult it's, when you're faced with some situation like that. Yeah, you, you've got to make decisions. In a sense, you've got to make decisions for the for the for the good of everybody. But having said that, at the end of the day, he's responsible for himself, and there's only so much you can do to help in situations. Mm. It's hard to find in that, you know, with that kind of yeah. way there, you know. Because you you think today, if only we had, yeah, possibly. It might have changed the timing and the difference. It might have ended up, but it's difficult. It really is. It is. But sometimes when you when you are challenged to, to do good, that it is very difficult to make a right decision. What is the best in this circumstance? But in that circumstance you're talking about, you did the right thing in the sense of you're protecting the others from uh, the impact. I remember remember when Bernard gave you a, a, a rum. Sweetie, yeah. and it just you know, always like I'm going straight to the brain, like oh, that's <laughs> out, you know, 
uh, and if you hadn't been so far down the road of recovery, that could have maybe just been enough to tip you back over. So, you know, it's a really difficult situation. It's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, but we're challenged, you know, to, uh, to demonstrate love. But love isn't being mamby pamby. You know, that's, we'll come a, a, a bit stronger in that later on. You know, there, there's there's love doesn't mean <coughs> always doing cozy gestures or, or nice things. That may not be the, the real definition of what that love needs for that individual. But what, what I'm saying also in, in this context, even Jesus, people turned away from Jesus, and you know who's going to turn away from? If Jesus came into this room tonight, who? Which one of us would turn our back on him? Hopefully none of us, uh, because you'd think, wow, you know, uh, what a character! I want to be around him. I want to listen to him all the time, and that's what the initial reaction was to a lot of people. But as they listened carefully to what he had to say, when he challenges them to change their lives and their lifestyle, then it's just, ooh, I don't want to do that. And they walk no more with him. They walk and no Jesus more had to say to, to the child, well, you will you also go away? away? And, uh, you know, Peter, for all his impetuosity and getting his foot in the, in the wrong, mm. you know, so often, but his response there is right. He said, who can we turn to? You've got the words of eternal life. He, Peter recognized at that point that, you know, who else was that who could speak in, and with the authority of Christ about, and, and, and offer eternal life? Nobody. Uh, and so there's that kind of a balance all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's a difficult passage for us, you know, do our neighbours, do our, the people around here, recognise us for, for, for people of love. Um, and it's a thing we struggle with, I think, in general as Christians, uh, in, in, a, in a wider context, because, mm -hmm. because we want to be, uh, to be right with God, because we want to have a, a right understanding of God's word, um, it's almost, when you look at it in the wider context of the world and, and, and some of the situations that's happened in time past, it's almost like it's really difficult to get the balance between being right with God, right with God's word, and not becoming pharisaical or, or uh, a, what's the word, um, uh, too, so strict that, that we, we isolate people uh, totally. And, and there's lots of fights going on over the last couple hundred years that's demonstrated that where we, we, we're trying to be do the right thing, mm. but sometimes the, thing, the way we say the right thing is, is isolated people and, 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 and put them off. But uh, it's a big challenge. It's, it's, love is not a, an it's not easy weakness. thing. It's not weakness. It's not weak, no. Uh, it's a, yeah, okay. I was coming up to my mind there. Okay. Uh, in order to achieve this goal, we start at God, okay? If we really want to love, then we've got to look to the greatest example. We've got to see, uh, be challenged by him. First John 4, he, we love because he first loved us. And we learn from God what it means to love. He loved the unlovable. He spent time with people when they didn't want to spend time with him. He demonstrated a compassion for people who really didn't appreciate the compassion. And it's trying to get that, that, that fine line between understanding what love is and how God wants us to act and, and learning how to d d distinguish how should we act in this situation for the best in any, any situation. Now, I guarantee we'll make mistakes. <laughs> That's guaranteed we'll make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes in that sense because he knows too much. Mm -hmm. But we often make mistakes because of our lack of knowledge. You know, God wouldn't maybe, maybe uh, when you think of, of his all-knowing, he might have treated that guy who came yesterday slightly different, but you didn't know what was going to happen next day. You know? And, and, and the same thing, could, the same guy in that kind of situation in times past, he might have been the same guy who came back and threw a brick in the window. You know? Uh, because you, you turned him away, you didn't, you know, didn't let him in with the guys. There's all that going on. And because we don't know the future, we don't always make the right decisions. Um, we can be lenient when we should have been strong, and we should have been, we can be strong when we should have been lenient. That's right, definition. Anyway, <laughs> true love is, is revealed by God. The love of God is misunderstood by many. We have a tendency to equate his love with that love that we feel for one another uh, in, a, in a 
thing, this kind of way, indulgent love, a changeable love, a sentimental love, an affectionate love, just all emotion, a strong or intense liking. Uh, a dictionary definitely indicates that these feelings are called love uh, and may be based upon all these things. Um, because, because my wife's a diabetic uh, and, and because I, I, I know a little bit more about sugar now than I used to know, uh, I, I get frustrated when I'm standing in, a, in a, a paper shop and a grandmother or a, even a mother comes in and she'll buy a two-year-old or a three-year-old these big um, Easter, uh, chocolate Easter egg type things, mm -hmm. absolutely full of sugar, absolutely full of sugar. And they don't know it, two year old and three year old, what they're doing is they're putting a taste for sugar into that child's life mm -hmm. that they're going to fight the rest of their life with. Trying to, trying to cut, and Bern is a good example. Goodness gracious, I don't know what your mum fed you, but when I first knew Bern, <laughs> he was five, five uh, spoons of sugar in his tea. Yeah. Five <laughs> spoons of sugar in his tea. I do know what I've done. Yeah. Go on. Down to half a spoonful. A half a spoonful. Good yeah. man. Yeah. You know, yeah. how, how you end didn't end up with diabetes, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this is what the, you know, it's, it's where the body, body uh, does that. But it's, it's interesting, a lot of us who are slightly older, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I didn't always look like this. You know, oh. even in my twenties, I was, I was, I was about nine stone. I don't know why I survived and all the sugar I've eaten. I know. <laughs> some well, some metabolism can handle it. When I first knew you in the steelworks, you were as thin as a lot. Yeah. There you are, see? I even had hair. Yeah. 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 Black hair. Yeah. All of Pharaoh's lean kind. Or so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, both of you guys are that kind of thing. <laughs> but, but us who are, are maybe, uh, you know, slightly Round different, down. yeah, and more yeah, rounded belt down. Down. Yeah. Yeah. We, we start with that. Uh, and it's a, it's a real so indulgence. Well, we 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 get that kids today saying you know give me give me give me, and, and the parents say okay here here you are. They don't realise the consequences are going to happen in, in ten years, fifteen years time when give me turns into that's mine by right. You know why you can't deny me because for years you taught me you wouldn't deny me. You know. Uh, Liz used to say, don't sit there eating sweets in front of me. You know I'll put weight on. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> Just look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of kiddies get this sugar and stuff on their dummies and things like that, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Just keeps them quiet. That's, that's love in a different way. We, keep, yeah. we, we, we learn tricks to keep them quiet. Honey. It's a good one. Anyway, uh, <laughs> our love is based quite often on, on personal family ties, uh, shared experience or interest, even sexual desire, emotional attachment, even for a pet or a treasured object. Uh, I, I know Frank will be, uh, there was a family we used to know uh, that had about four or five uh, little dogs uh, and they were, as, they were as good as, as our kids. And when, when my son Andrew died, uh, she consoled Susan by saying, I know how you feel. One of my dogs died recently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, well, I, you know, for her, may have, that may be. Fixed. And I remember what I said. I said one occasion that God is spelt G O D, not D O G. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 the you know some people uh, 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 can do all that type of stuff. Uh, and uh, we love sports. We love sports. Uh, a majority of people, uh, young men in the nation. You know, if you, if you walk into any locker room when you go to work, uh, everybody's talking, what well, did you see the football match last night? Did you see what they did? What did you do? Oh, wow, you know, and, and they know all about it. They love everything about it. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, their enthusiasm, their love for sports, uh, love for the brotherhood and, and need. Hmm. Okay, this misconception, we then, then think, well, God, when he talks about love, must be thinking love in the same terms as we do. That's the kind of loving God we have, you know. Uh, we, we can upset him easily. He gets fickle. He's, you know, he, he, he has chosen one person over another person. But that's not the case. That's not the love that we find in God. Um, <clears throat> we we need to maybe th then understand better uh, the kind of God that we have and the kind of love that He has. Some feel that we can do what we like and live as we like because God, because He's a God of love will allow and overlook many things which he's forbidden. They say, God's not going to send a person to hell because he's a God of love. You know, it's, uh, they, they don't understand what they're saying there, really. God isn't going to send you to hell because uh, he's, a, he's a God of love. 
you, if you choose that particular path, then that's the place you're going to end up. Uh, it's your choice to do that. He's not going to send you there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if we don't take that, it's a bit like a drowning man. If, if you throw him a life, a, a life uh, boy, mm-hmm. life boy, <laughs> life, life, girl, life, life belt. Mm-hmm. If you throw him a life belt and he, he says, "Oh, it's deathly. I don't want that." Well, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. if you don't cry, yeah, you're going to drown. Oh, well, that's my choice. Well, fair enough. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that, that's a bit like how we see you in God. You know, uh, God throws us a lifetime. He says, "A lifeline." I've sent my son to die for you. What more do you want? Uh, and we say, no, that's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, we want to live our way. Yeah. So, uh, the failure to understand the relationship of God's love, because God's love at the same time has got to be balanced by his concept of God as a just God. God is a merciful God. And how does God, his justice and his mercy, how can God be both at the same time? How could God deal with this merciful and yet people not turn around and say, ah, you let him off? How can you let him off? Because look at a horrible guy like that. How can you let him off? You imagine getting up into heaven, Roger, and, and meeting Hitler. And say, what's the game? What's going on here, God? How on earth can you let him in? What to do with you? Let him in. See? Uh, and, and it's difficult for us to understand that. Uh, that the, the blood of Christ can save the worst kind of people. I used to have an illustration I used quite often uh, about uh, uh, some people getting a ticket for the, for, for the opera or for the or for, for a, a, a what do you call them? Sunset Boulevard. But they, they, down in London you go and see these films. What do you call the films? Uh, in the theatre. You know, Phantom of the Opera. What do you call that? Oh, yeah. opera. Play. Musicals, musicals, yeah, musical. Okay. okay, a lot of people don't like the opera, so you have get musicals. Uh, and somebody comes around knocking the doors in your street and says, Look, I've got some free tickets for the Phantom of the Opera. Do you fancy them? And so, when is it? It's next month. Well, oh, yeah, I fancy that. So, you, you get a, a ticket, it's free. Yeah, free. All we like to do is turn up and give them a ticket, you'll be all right. Knocks next door. And uh, she loves musicals even more than I do. Anyway, she's in there. Uh, and uh, knock on your door and say, a free ticket for Phantom of the Opera. I says, well, no, I've seen it there already. Uh, no, I don't really fancy it. Uh, it's free. Uh, nah, I don't fancy it anyway. Uh, push off. Okay. So, <laughs> a, couple, a month later comes her along, and you're, you're standing in the queue. And lo and behold, your neighbour turns up in the queue. And uh, they get, uh, you get to the, the, the gate, and you hand over your ticket. You go in and see the... Uh, past the turnstile, and you get let in, and she comes up behind and says, uh, I-, I want to come in, and they say, well, where's your ticket? They say, well, I-, I didn't take it at the time, I didn't really fancy going at the time, but I've changed my mind, so I want to get in. So you can't get in with that ticket. Well, you let him in. He's hot, I'm his neighbour, you should see that guy, he's a tour rug. You let him in, why can't I get in? And so they argue for not getting in on the basis of, because they don't, they don't like you, he's a nasty kind of person, but he's got a ticket. Jesus is our ticket, and sometimes we, you know, we certainly some days don't deserve a ticket, but we've got the ticket, and and that's the means for we die and get up and and to heaven, and we're going to let in not because we're good looking, not because we're perfect, but because we've got a ticket, we've got the blood of Christ, and our next door neighbour who could be a better person than us, who could be a nicer person than us, who could be. <clears throat> outstrip us in practically every way and as far as his living is concerned won't get in and you can imagine him standing in the queue saying you yeah, listen him in why not me because they didn't take the opportunity to grasp all the blood of Christ would be made available and that's hard that's harsh but God's love has got to meet his justice and his mercy he says there is a way that Despite who you are, despite what you've done, despite all these drawbacks, if you accept my blood, the, the blood of my son, you can get in. And that's his way of, of being able to deal with the justice has been met, because Jesus has paid the price. And my love, I want you to come in. And that's why I supplied the blood, in order for you to have the opportunity. Mm. So the balance between God's love it's going to be balanced by his justice, it's going to be balanced by his mercy. And it's difficult to get that balance just right. 
but he's paid the price that we may be able to get in. And if we don't take advantage of tickets while it's available, then we're going to be in a, in a bad state. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 3, 50, 40. Hey, you better keep it, you have to keep your ticket in the wallet. Uh, Ephesians 3, 14, we find a prayer of the Apostle Paul for the church at Ephesus. He says, when I think of the wisdom and the scope of God's plan, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will give you mighty inner strength through his Holy Spirit. I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. Really, and some of us, we don't read the Bible enough. In, in just one or a couple of sentences there, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources that God will give us a mighty, not, a, not inner strength, a mighty inner strength through his Holy Spirit and pray that Christ will more and more be at home in our hearts as we trust him that our roots may go down deep into the soil of his marvellous love you plant something and you make sure it's got a good source of, of food you water it and you watch it hopefully grow develop blossom God says that's what I want for you that your roots may go down deep into the soil of his marvelous love Isn't that beautiful that's 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 power power in action and that's God's inspiration for us God's desire for us that we may be filled with his love and that may, we may be solidly rooted. And no matter what the world throws at us, they can't touch us. Because our, our roots are deep in the, our in the understanding and our relationship with the love of God through the sacrifice of His Son. It's, it's good stuff. We sing a chorus that says the same thing, based on that passage. Verse 18 says, that you may have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep His love really is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is so great, you'll never fully understand it. Then you'll be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. That's motivational stuff. That's inspirational stuff. That's, that's power to live. When you're waking up in the morning thinking, God loves me. Christ died for me. This is a day that I can rejoice in and, and be overflowing in my attitude even for my neighbor. The day I'm going to be nice to him or her. Just Stephen, you know, once. Okay. But I challenge but he gives us the ability. Yeah. You know, the, Paul says in a different way, you know, set your minds on the things that are above. When our minds are secure in who God is and what Christ has done for us, then we look at people a different way. We look at yeah. the world a different way. We look at yeah. our lives a different you, way. You never, know, you never know what effect you're having on your neighbors, really. No. I, I tell you, this, 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 this is true. Isabel was in hospital for nine months and several times during that period I had run-ins with the staff nurse, the Lord sister, because she, she wasn't really treating Isabel well and I really told Ross several times. Eventually, the, the last week that she was in the hospital, she came to me. She said, Mr. Morgan, I want you to know that uh, I'm going back to church on Sunday and I'm taking my children with me. And she said, Mrs. Warren, you are responsible for that. Yeah. That's what you're going to tell us about that. And yeah. she's the one who told her. Yeah. And I never, I never expected that. No, because, because of that antagonistic uh -huh. situation. Uh -huh. uh, 
I, I had a long time ago about Willie Steele. I don't know how, I, I think it's true. Uh, I, he, he died. I knew Willie Steele very well. Yeah, he died chasing, chasing vandals chasing away life. from the building. <laughs> um, I have that. But uh, apparently, about two years after he died, somebody walked into the congregation on a Sunday night in a gospel meeting, and uh, the, the preacher was totally amazed because when he finished preaching, this guy wanted to become a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he'd never seen him before, never seen him meeting before. Uh, and it, it turned out, uh, when the conversation with the guy, and see what he, you know, what, what uh, understood what he was doing, he says, I worked with Willie Steele for years, and I always argued with him. Always argued with him. And I bet Willie Steele thought, what's the point of talking to that guy? Because mm -hmm. I'm totally wasting my time. And yet, two years after Willie Steele died, that man walked in. He wasn't converted that night. No. He was converted by Willie Steele's words, even after Willie Steele had died. It came through to him, I need to do something about the knowledge I gained from that man who was living. Oh, that's uh, true. Jim McGuigan, in one of his books, a good, good book, uh, he described the situation where uh, three times in America he was he was a, a special fruit, a gospel mission retreat type thing, and he was there. And the first time uh, this person brought up a uh, a person, he says, "This person wants to talk to you, you know." And, and you know, there's a lot of people there, and you see a lot of people when you're in that situation. You see a lot of people. You don't always remember them. Uh, and this situation, he wants to talk. Okay, so <laughs> Jim spent about an hour with this guy, and really. He was getting nowhere. They, they, they were just, you know, the guy was, I don't know, he, he, he said, he, he, that afterwards he said to the, the woman, why did you get, bring him to me? He, he really just wanted to argue. you. Anyway, um, so he spent an hour with him. He went away about the next year, another year came by, and, and uh, a similar area, he was doing a similar thing, and the same woman walked up to the same guy and said, this guy would like to talk to you. And, you know, Jim was very patient, uh, he could easily send him push off, last year didn't get, but anyway, he talked to him, uh, and again, it was kind of same, he said, we get nowhere. So, for a couple of years after that, Jim used to use him as an example, he says, there's some people you're going to talk to, and you're just wasting your time. It's just, you know, you're, you're spinning your wheels, but you really don't know it at the time, it's just one of those things. He was somewhere else preaching, <laughs> and this guy walked up, uh, the, the, the he said, do you remember me? And well. Jim said, no, I don't remember you. He says, uh, remember such and such, and when we talked, and it clicked. Jim, oh, I remember you. He says, I've become a Christian. Mm. He said, Jim said, you become a Christian? I've been using you as a bad example of how you can wait for a time for you. You know what that's true? You haven't a clue, really, mm. what yeah, impact no. you'll have on people. So it's, it's really a, a, an amazing thing, okay? So uh, this kind of passage, uh, such an impact on your life when you, you know, this is the kind of passage really, what you should do is, is you should put it on a piece of paper and, and have it at your bed, in front of your bed, or in a front of a door to go through regularly, okay? So much power God wants to instill into your life through the words of, of the Apostle Paul in this thing, you know? It's just such a power, the power to understand all God's people should. How wide, long, high, and deep God's love really is. That you may experience His love of Christ. Though it's so great, we'll never fully understand it. And you'll be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. That's, you know, that's a Sometimes we feel inadequate. Sometimes we feel that we're not the people we ought to be. But in passages like that, God says, I'm challenging you to be the people you ought to be. But more than that, I'm going to empower you and enable you and encourage you and inspire you to become that kind of people. That's awesome. It's amazing. And that's God's love personified. We'll hold it there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The story. You, you, that, that verse John, 1 John 4, 17. Mm -hmm. 1 John 4, 16 says, There is no fear in love. Perfect love. But, but,